YouTube and all Repairman Jack fans. My name is Nathan. Thank you so much for watching and welcome to my channel. This is my longer discussion video for Night World, which is, let's say, book 17 in the Repairman Jack series and what, book number seven, let's say, in the adversary cycle. Um, the reason why I'm laughing is because I don't even know what to do anymore with with the numbers. I mean, <laughs> if you're if you're new to this, I've been reading through all of the books in the Repairman Jack series, and I've been doing two videos on each. So I do a short spoiler-free review video and then a longer discussion video. But and I, I this is not a bad thing. However, Wilson continues to publish new books. Since I've started this series, we have got three new books that all tie in to either the Adversary Cycle or Repairman Jack. So with Repairman Jack, we now have The Last Christmas. So the series goes from having 16 books, let's say, plus the crime thrillers, the Fear City, Cold City, and ooh, what is the Dark City? There we go. Um, that we go from, we, we still have those ones. We still have the Young Adult Trilogy, but we now have got Scarlet Redux, a graphic novel. We also have got The Last Christmas, which is a Repairman Jack book that goes in between Fatal Error and The Dark at the End, I think. And we now have got a new book in the Adversary Cycle, which I just got. So I've got the advanced reader copy. That's why it's got the, the Not For Resale um, banner on there. Uh, that this now goes, this is now considered a prelude to Night World. And how do I know that? Because it says the adversary cycle, a prelude to Night World right on the cover. So, okay, I do this in every video. I say, here's the book that came before and here's the book that comes after. All right, so part of this is easy. There's no book that comes after Night World. Night World is it in terms of the chronology. There are books that have been published after Night World, but in terms of the chronology of the series, there's nothing that takes place after Night World. And that has not changed. Everything else has changed, though. So, The Dark at the End was originally the Repairman Jack book that came before Night World. And then Reprisal was the um, Adversary Cycle book that came before Night World. But now, in the Repairman Jack series, it's The Last Christmas that comes before... Or sorry, it's not The Last Christmas, it's still The Dark at the End, but The Last Christmas comes before The Dark at the End. So we've now got 17 books in the series, I guess? Even on Amazon, then Night World is listed as book number 16 in the series. But I don't think it is anymore. I think it's now book number 17. I still don't know what to do with the crime thrillers or the young, young adult series or the graphic novel. And then with the adversary cycle, it's now book number 7? Because Signals is now book number six. So believe me, I'm not saying this, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. If I'm complaining at all, it's just in the sense of the, the reason why, one of the reasons why I started doing these videos is because I felt like there was this big gap for anybody who maybe wanted to start reading the series, but they didn't know where to begin. And I figured, if I do this as an experiment and I start making these videos, then what can happen is that can kind of be a blueprint for other people to either read the books in the order that I've read them in, or I might make suggestions as I go through the series. So now I'm all confused. I still don't know what order you should really read these books in. I know that Wilson has got his reading order at the end of each book. And basically he's got year zero and where everything fits into the secret history of the world and that you can start, you've got the short stories and then standalone novels. Like you've got black wind, for instance, that's not an adversary cycle book, but it still fits into the secret history of the world. And then you've got like all of these other books. You've got the adversary cycle books. You've got Jack, you've got short stories, but is that really realistic to tell people that they need to read like 30 something books before reading Night World or before, if you're gonna read the Repairman Jack series, you need to read the Adversary Cycle and the short fiction and all of that. That it's helpful if you already know that you want to read absolutely everything to do with this story universe. However, 
if you are new to it, it can be so intimidating that I don't know how, I have been trying to figure out how to even suggest to somebody who has not read these books where to even begin. And I've kind of got some ideas for that, but I'm gonna save that for other videos. I think I'm gonna start doing standalone videos, not reviewing a particular book, but just things like, you know, here's my suggested reading order and you know, here are like the top five books in the series, stuff like that. Now, the other thing that I should say with Nightworld before I get into some of my specific thoughts with it is that it is revised. So we've got the 2012 revised edition of Nightworld and this is because Wilson, um, it, when he first published Nightworld in 1993, and this is the mass market paperback edition that I have, he had only written the tomb in the Repairman Jack series, and that was it wasn't even a series. The tomb was a standalone adversary cycle novel. Like it's part of the adversary cycle, so I guess it's not a standalone, but it kind of acts as a standalone. That it wasn't a, a series of we're gonna be reading all these other books featuring Jack. But then he goes and writes 14 other books in the Repairman Jack series, plus the young young adult ones, before Nightworld came out. So the, the, the revised edition. So then the original edition of Night World didn't really make sense because Jack doesn't have as much of a role. Him and Glaken like have barely known each other and we don't have any references to any of the interesting characters that we met in the Repairman Jack series. So I'd mentioned this before in my short spoiler free review video, but you know, we don't have people like the lady and the dog, the, the news sphere, like references to that. We don't have Eddie and Wheezy and Ernst Drexler and the Septimus Order and Hank Thompson and the Kickers. Like, we don't have any of that stuff in the original edition of Night World. You do, however, have all of that in the revised edition. So I have not read the original edition cover to cover, but there are specific moments where I really wanted to know what's changed and what stayed the same and what did Wilson do. So I, I did kind of go back and forth between the two. And there's interesting things that are happening there because obviously all of the stuff, like we've got completely new passages in the revised edition where you've got stuff that happens to Ernst Drexler, you've got stuff that happens to Hank Thompson. And then Jack has got a much bigger role. As far as I can tell, um, and like I say, I've not read it cover to cover, but like Jack doesn't even go into the hole at the end of the book with Glaken to fight Rosalem in the original edition. But then Jack goes into the hole into you know the like in Central Par Park where Glaken already is and Glaken's got the sword and he's fighting Rosalind and Jack goes in there and he starts shooting and you know all this like fun Jack stuff that he's actually helping Glaken. Well, that I guess wasn't in the original edition. So there's all of that now. As far as Night World. I've got a fair number of thoughts, but I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. So just to kind of give you a sense of what's happening here, you've got different groups that are all coming together. And this really is the culmination of Wilson's career that he's been writing these two different series that have been, they, they are kind of companion series where you've got Repairman Jack and then the adversary cycle where you could read one or the other, or you could read both together but you're not compelled to read one like if, if you read the adversary cycle you don't have to read the repairman jack series likewise if you read repairman jack you don't have to read the adversary cycle but it probably helps if you do and i think that this probably makes more sense to people now especially if you're talking to somebody who's maybe thinking about reading the series and they're confused Kind of makes sense if you think about like the marvel cinematic universe where it's like you've got all of the iron man movies and then you have the avenger movies right where you could say well all iron man movies are part of the marvel universe and you could watch all of them but in order to watch all of them you're going to be watching some avenger movies because iron man is in some of the avenger movies or you could just watch the Avenger movies and not watch the Iron Man movies, but you're still going to see Iron Man because he's in the Avengers. That's basically what Wilson's doing here. It's a big story universe and there's crossovers and you can do whatever you want with that. You can be as involved a reader as you want or you know, you could read just kind of standalones, especially, well, in both series, but especially early Repairman Jack or The Adversary Cycle. 
but we've got different groups in this book. So you've kind of got the Repairman Jack group. You've got Jack and Abe and Gia and Vicky, where that whole series, you've got all of them. You've also got um, Hank Thompson and Ernst Drexler. That's all the Repairman Jack stuff. You've got that group, and we're kind of following around different ones throughout the book. You've also got Kolobadi and her boyfriend Moki. So Kolobadi is from The Tomb, which is also a Repairman Jack book, but she was just in that um, because she's got the necklaces that play a prominent role. You've got Sylvia Nash, Alan, Ba, and Jeffy from The Touch. You've got uh, Glaken, Magda, and then the, the folks in that little village in Romania from The Keep. You've also got and I have not read Reborn or Reprisal yet, but you've, I'm presuming here, Bill and Carol and Nick, who are in either both Reborn and Reprisal, or at least one or the other. So you've got all of these different groups from all of these books in the adversary cycle, and they all come together in Nightworld, that it really is the culmination of Wilson's publishing career, essentially. Um, he's still got other stuff that's separate from this, but he's really pulling together most of what he's written throughout his life into this book. And you might be wondering, like, how well does it work? And I think it works really, really well. What I'll say kind of generally about Nightworld is you still have got thriller elements like what you see in Repairman Jack. So it's written in the style to some degree of a Repairman Jack book where when I say thriller, I mean, we're following different groups of people and we're getting chapters that are doing a tight point of view on that person. You have that, I think, with some books in the adversary cycle. It's been a long time since I've read some of them. Like it's been probably 15 years since I've read The Keep. So I, I will get to that. But I don't think we really get that so much with The Keep. Um, I think you get it to some degree with The Touch, but not that much. So it's in that style, though, of Repairman Jack, where you have all these different characters. But as far as the overall tone, the mood, or the atmosphere to Night World, it's much more of a horror story, I would say, than a thriller. So it's told in the style of a thriller, but it's the tone or mood of the, the atmosphere of a horror story, which is great. And I find it really compelling for that reason. Um, Wilson does write horror, and he writes science fiction and thrillers and medical thrillers and stuff like that so he he does jump around but i really like his horror writing and there's moments in here that are really good examples of horror i'll say kind of generally as well i think the first maybe two-thirds of the book probably function i think they're more satisfying than the last third the whole buildup of these holes that start showing up across earth in various places and then it, you know you get the the short the shortening of days the decreasing amount of daylight hours and then all of the the crazy stuff the insects the monsters the creatures that come out of these holes and attack everybody that everything that has been secret this cosmic shadow war that's been going on since for millennia right between Rosalind and Glake and the ally and the otherness all of that just becomes undeniable to the world that it's all been beneath the surface nobody would ever really know or suspect and if you ever saw some strange event that happened people would just dismiss it as you know you being a kook or or whatever but nobody can deny things things have permanently changed with night world even at the end of it when you know the the ally is able to retake earth you know that like my question would be what happens next to all of these people on earth and i gotta think like one of the things that would happen is you would get really crazy religions that come out of that if that makes sense to you that you would have people who don't understand what happened who don't understand the cosmic shadow war between the ally and the otherness and who Glaken is and Rosalem and them being basically avatars for these two forces in the universe and earth just being a small part of this entire game that essentially has gone on forever and maybe will go on forever that most people are not going to know what really happened 
Jack's not going to tell them. Everybody else who's involved is not going to tell them. So what, to me, what would happen is as much as the world will, you know, go back to normal and they'll rebuild and everything else, I think ultimately you would get some really strange religious beliefs that would come out of this. New religions that would try to account for everything that's happened. And it certainly would, I think, challenge established religions to a fair degree. I mean, even like, I mean, I'm most familiar with Christianity. And so with Christianity, then the events in Night World don't really match up with the book of Revelation. So I guess like, you know what I mean? Like theologians would have some explaining to do, <laughs> I guess, in the story universe. But as far as the horror elements, I think they work so well. The earth changes. People see all of this stuff that's happening and it just becomes undeniable. And that stuff's really, really great. As far as the ending, the battle between Rosalem and Blaken, it's not that... I, I hesitate to say that it's disappointing because it's not but it kind of feels like Wilson has set this impossible bar to clear where he's built it up so much. And I think everything in night world pays off from like, there's a payoff from everything that we've read up until this point, but then Glaken's battle with Rosalem. Rosalem is basically just in this, um, you know, he's, he's in this like sack that's sitting over top, like with like different columns, holding him as he transforms into this new being and Glaken is basically trying to like cut the columns with the sword to get Rosalem to fall into the pit and so you don't really get a lot of action there right if you see what I mean that I think we had more action with the dark at the end where Jack is going after Rosalem with stinger missiles and shooting at him as he like takes off in the boat and, and all of that that there's and even that, it's mostly attacking Rosalem, but not Rosalem attacking back. There's not a battle, so to speak. It's pretty one-sided. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I wonder, because I don't know what else to do. Because if you allow Rosalem to go through the change and to be fully converted into whatever new form the otherness is going to um, turn him into, then he would just be... I mean, it's basically written that he would be unstoppable even with Glaken, you know, having the, like being the Sentinel again. So I feel like he's just kind of in this tough position of you can't give Rosalem too much power because then that ruins, um, like it, you can't then defeat him. So he has to be in this vulnerable state. But I'm saying as far as a climax to the series, I wonder what other people think if you feel like it just it doesn't quite deliver because Wilson just sets it up so much and I'm saying this is somebody who loves the book I really do love Night World and I like how it ends but I feel like it maybe would have been there, there's maybe something a little unsatisfying about the fact that we don't get a proper battle between Rosalem and Glaken that's basically what I, what I have to say about that part of it. All right. The, let, let me get into, um, I'll get into some specific notes and then I've got uh, another point about like kind of a general comment about the book. So one thing that's interesting, this is page 25 of the hardcover edition. You have this explanation that the world is, is and has become more violent as Rosalem has started taking over and as he's been strengthening. And that actually makes sense because we've seen that, especially with, um, I'm trying to think of which book it is. If it's, it's not the dark at the end. I think it's fatal error where, um, you know, Jack, he goes, he flies out to Hollywood and then he comes back and the, the kickers and the Septimus order have taken down the internet. And so as a result of that, then he's trying to get to the airport um, to pick up Gia and Vicky. And 
he's getting harassed along the way and people are attacking him and then you've got the guys at the airport attacking Gia and Vicky and it's like some of that I'm like wow does that does that feel real does it seem like that's the kind of thing that would happen in those circumstances but according to that explanation that's why people are becoming more violent that's why the kickers are becoming more violent and people who've got very likely a lot of O DNA um, that they're becoming more violent as a result of Rosalind strengthening okay the passages and I, I won't get into all of them but the passages that deal with Rosalind and especially his transformation the ones that are all in italics it's some of Wilson's best writing it, I, I imagine that he really enjoyed writing those passages because they are so fun um, you get it at the very beginning of the book which also appears at the end of the dark at the end of you know Rosalind standing on the mountain and the the prose the the actual line for line um words they become much more flowery um uh, much more poetic and really fun to read as Rosalind transforms in in that whole in central park you've also got really great horror that comes up throughout this book and the first passage that i really marked with that is page 66 where you've got um nick and i forget who else it is who goes into the hole with him but another i, I think geologist who goes into the hole where they they descend down and it, it's a really good passage of horror um i read a lot of horror um in case you can't tell with like all of my stephen king books over there and um below that right i've got more horror down there as well but it's so for somebody who reads a lot of horror i'm saying it works and i really enjoy it there's also on page 187 this is bill who's speaking and i love this it's it's essentially a commentary or a meditation on people and specifically good people when the world is going crazy when there's a need for good people to step up and they're talking about the all of the uh like the military and the police who are standing outside of the hole in central park and they're doing everything they can as nightfall is approaching to try to stop these monsters from coming up and killing people and they've all like and they keep getting decimated every time they go out because it's not the first night that they've done this but that more people continue to go there to try to stop these creatures from coming into earth and it's great it's great that um we have people like that who are willing to be so brave when you, you've got to imagine just everything in you screams to run away and, and some people don't and that is an incredible thing about humanity and wilson has got a really good commentary that it's bill who's speaking here and what he says so um i think it's carol who says um I can't believe they're going to try this again she said those men down there must either be very brave or very crazy and then this is bill responding i'd venture they're neither they're doing a job everybody else can go nuts throw up their hands and say nothing matters anymore the world's coming to an end so screw everything and let's party let's go wild let's do all the things we never allowed ourselves to do when we knew there'd be a price to pay let's get drunk get stoned raped pillage kill destroy burn everything to the ground just because we feel like it but we'll always have a certain small percentage who will go on doing their jobs people with an overriding sense of duty of responsibility of obligation to try to keep things running to ignore the end of the world zeitgeist and simply keep going people who know that to let yourself go crazy is to say that your day-to-day -day life has been a sham that you've been a hypocrite that your lifestyle has been little more than play acting like saying hey you know everything i've said and done up until now it's all been a lie this is the real me no matter what Rosalind throws at that small percentage of humans they're not going to back down some of them are around that goddamn hole right now and so I'm saying that they're brave for doing this and Wilson's saying or really it's Bill who's speaking who's saying well they're doing a job and they have to keep doing the job but I think there is bravery of course in that and people will do that people continue um you know like following uh, observing their own duty their own sense of duty and like i say it is a wonderful thing that that happens and i like that commentary that you have and wilson does a good job where as much as his books are uh, plot driven 
and they're carefully crafted in that way, he still finds places to have some commentary. All right. Um, this is a interesting thought that I have. I think it's interesting. It's on page 223. And it talks about Bill having all of these walls around himself. It says, Bill seemed to have built a wall around himself as if he were practicing being a nobody. That certainly sounds like Jack. All these walls around him practicing being a nobody. Sylvia Nash seems to have the same thing, right? That she's got all of these walls around her. Glaken seems to have the same thing. So you look at this and you're like, so it's really interesting because you've got multiple characters throughout the adversary cycle that are like Jack, who kind of not necessarily isolate themselves, but are very protective over their own life and don't share it and don't share very much about themselves very easily. And I've got, I've got another thought on that, but I want to wait until I get to the next passage to bring it up. So I think it's, it's, um, you know, it's on page 376 that it's talking about Rosalind wanting people to be separated and isolated. And it says that, this is that towards the bottom of the page, you know, what if we refuse to run screaming in fear back to our hidey holes? What if we stand here as a group and defy him? There's a defect up there, a hole in Rosalind's night. Maybe we can keep it open. Maybe we can even widen it. Um, what have we got to lose? It's not already lost. Uh, oh, sorry. And it also says that his whole thrust has been to isolate us from each other, to use fear to break us up into separate frightened little islands. But look at what's happened up there. Right. And so it's an interesting question that I have of as much as it's a bad thing to be isolated, that Rosalind wants to isolate human beings. At the same time, there's a certain strength to it. Right. And this is so let me jump forward here. This is very close to the end of it on page 397. It's the second last page of the book. Then it says, um, isn't it? It's always been that way, hasn't it? We've always been in charge, but we've never taken control. We just let ourselves get pushed this way and that. Fear is like a disease, and I guess some of us have better immune systems than others. Sometimes we need a little help from others, but we all have the power to step aside and say, I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. And I think this is kind of what I mean, that on the one hand, that obviously with people being separate, like so Jack, being separate from society, one of the strengths of being separate from society is that you don't get tossed around by whatever the media says. You don't get tossed around by trends and fads and whatever the crowd is doing. That Jack doesn't care what trends are and what the crowd's doing. I mean, he only cares in so far as he needs to pay attention to fashion to some degree to blend in. But he really doesn't care about that type of stuff. And he doesn't care about what the media says of what you should be afraid of and what you shouldn't be afraid of. He just kind of makes his own decisions. And so I think there's a certain strength in isolating yourself in that way, separating yourself. But Rosalind wants people to isolate themselves so that way the fear can grow. And we do tend, especially when we're dealing with frightening times, human beings like to collect together and things become less frightening typically when there's more of us. Like if you think about it, when you've been most scared in your life, it's probably when you've been most alone, right? That if you're, if you're in a house by yourself and you hear some strange sound, then it's going to be more frightening than if you're in a house and there's like 10 people with you and there's a strange sound, right? That just we're more vulnerable when we're alone. And I guess that's the distinction is that as much as Jack separates himself from society and, you know, perhaps Bill does and Sylvia where they're kind of, they're not very open and vulnerable to other people. They're still surrounded by other people. If that makes any sense that it, there, there, there seems to be some kind of balance there between you want to avoid getting caught up with trends, but you don't want to be so isolated that you don't have the help of other human beings, right? And Jack, because he lives in New York City, he's able, even though he has all of these walls around him, he still has a lot of help. He's got Abe, he's got Julio, he's got Ernie, Russ Tweet, he's got a bunch of these people 
that he can rely on. Uh, the Ash brothers as well who show up in Nightworld, that he's got a bunch of people that he can rely on. And he also comes out of his own isolation in becoming more and more involved with Gia and with Vicky and becoming kind of a family man. And, and even with his um, siblings throughout the series and with um, Kate and with Tom and with his father, that he starts reconnecting with people after he pulled away. And that seems to be a strength, right? So that kind of ties into Rosalind wants us to be isolated and alone. And Jack kind of is isolated and alone, but then increasingly starts letting more people into his life. So I know that that's not, I haven't perfectly formulated my thoughts on that, but it's an interesting commentary that Rosalind wants people alone. And that's both a strength and a weakness. There's a, a really strange moment here on page 315 where Jack feels like he's failed everybody because he tried to get the necklaces from Cola Body and he's ultimately able to get her to New York City, but then she runs off with both of the necklaces and then he feels like he's completely failed. Now what happens with that is um, he's beating himself up for it, but then everybody else um, you know, kind of surrounds Jack so I think this is Bill. Um, he stepped forward toward Jack and extended his hand. Jack eased away from Sylvia and gripped Bill's hand. Then Carol hugged him. Then Glaken offered his own hand. His throat working, his voice on the very edge of crumbling, Jack stepped back and stared at the semicircle that had formed around him. You people, you people, where'd you all come from? Where have you been all my life? His voice seemed to fail him then. He took a deep, uh, he took a deep breath, held it, then let it out as he turned to Glaken. So Jack is incredibly moved by these people who don't really know him very well, but when Jack is beating himself up and feeling like he's a failure, they still support him. And he's really moved by this. Now, I thought it was strange, this whole, you people, you people, where'd you all come from? Where have you been all my life? Because I've just read 16 books in the Repairman Jack series in fairly short order, and I'm looking at this going, that doesn't seem like that's how Jack would respond. He's learned to rely on people. He's learned to let other people in with Gia, with Vicky, um, you know, especially with what happened with um, his unborn daughter, with Emma, and then with his sister, with his brother, with his dad, seeing him even with Abe and to some degree with Julio and all of these customers that he's had along the way. I look at this and I'm like, Jack wouldn't be so surprised that people care about him, even if he feels like a failure. So I'm like, it just doesn't feel like the Jack that we've come to know. So I checked the original edition and that passage is exactly as it's written in the original edition as well. And I guess Wilson just chose not to change it. And I get that. I get that. It's not bad. And I don't think that anybody would really notice it unless you've kind of done what I've done where you've read these books in really short order and then you get to this passage and you're like well Jack shouldn't be that surprised that people care about him and he shouldn't be that surprised that people care about him even after he makes a mistake in his head what's a mistake or even after he's failed um, he's had a lot of people who you know have supported him um, but because when Wilson wrote night world there was only the tomb and in the tomb if you remember jack isn't even in a relationship with gia at that point right that they had already broken up and so it's you know that's why he ends up with cola body for for most of the tomb so then he gets to night world and it's like jack's this loner he doesn't let people in and uh, but now when you read night world after reading the 16 books in the repairman jack series before we get to night world then it's like oh no, Jack's not that much of a loner anymore. Um, he, he's kind of changed. Uh, all right, page 329. I've got a question, and I, I do need help on this. There's this character, George Haskins. It says, Jack remembered him from two years ago, George Has Haskins, the man they were looking for, except now he looked younger. No matter, this was the guy. And I don't know. This is out on, I think, in Monroe um, on Long Island. And it's the guy who has got the little people to forge the sword from the the pieces that they have and like the necklaces to make the hilt and all of that that uh, it's got to be a short story 
that I haven't read yet. I do have Quick Fixes, which is the short fiction that's all collected together of Repairman Jack. So I'm assuming it's in there. But if somebody can help me out, who is George Haskins and where have we seen him before? Where else does he show up in the series? Because unless I totally miss something, I don't remember Jack meeting this guy two years ago. Okay, page 334. <laughs> it's, I'm not saying it's Wilson, but I just have a note here about, my note says, the attitude towards firearms in this series, and then dot, dot, dot with my ellipses points. Uh, so Gia eventually, like Gia is anti-gun, right? Jack is obviously very pro-gun. Abe is very pro-gun. Um, now, Jack and Gia having these different views on firearms seems like it's not really a problem. It's just one of those things of she doesn't get it and he doesn't get the fact that she doesn't get it, right? That they just don't agree on this. But Abe is such an advocate for the fact that everybody should have firearms. Everybody should have weapons of self-defense, for all kinds of reasons, men, women, everybody, and everybody should be trained with them. That it essentially makes society safer, right? And, and that's certainly the argument for people who are, you know, very uh, defensive over the Second Amendment, right? People who, who really believe that that needs to be defended and advocated for, uh, that that right to self-defense and to the right to bear arms needs to be protected. So Abe is absolutely one of those guys. I mean, he has the argument that, you know, like there'd be less crime because if a, a criminal sees a, a person, he doesn't see them being a vulnerable mark to rob them anymore or a home to go and invade and steal stuff or to hijack somebody's car or, you know, to assault a person on the street that they're going to look at that and say, well, that person could have a gun. That person could have a gun. I don't want to necessarily go there. I'm going to avoid that, that person because I could get killed um, or really badly wounded. And it's like, <laughs> it's like Abe and Jack win in this moment because Gia, just because like her and Abe and Vicky are in the bunker that he has um, out in Pennsylvania. And those creepy crawly things are munching their way through the steel and the concrete and they get into the bunker and they're just shooting and blasting away and blasting away and Gia just gets to the point of I need you to teach me how firearms work I need you to be, to be trained on them and then when she does when she actually shoots the shotgun she loves it she loves it and like he just Abe is trying to help her reload the weapon and it's like she's like don't take it <laughs> you know it's kind of this charlton heston from my cold dead hands you will not get my firearm and he's like i was just trying to reload i wasn't even trying to take it from you but it's she just immediately loves the power that she has by using a firearm so that's why i've just got my note of just the attitude towards firearms in this series just it it's like wilson and i, I hesitate to say that it's his attitude but at least in the series, the way he's crafted it, it's like he can't allow even one character to not have a firearm and to not love guns. It's like, he's like, before I'm done, and he's very close to the end of the series here, before I'm done, everyone's going to have a gun and everybody's going to love having a gun. And I just think that it's it's a very funny thing. It, there's no commentary for me. I'm not saying, hey, it's a good thing, bad thing. There's no political commentary here. I'm just saying, it's a thing in the series, and I think it's pretty funny. Um, all right, almost finished here. There's a, a very strange moment with um, all of these people. This is towards the end of the book where you get that little pinhole of light after Glaken, you know, takes the sword and he's re-imbued with all of this power as the sentinel on Earth, the avatar for the, for the ally. So you get this little bit of light over his building and then that, that bit of light, that circle of light expands and starts expanding more and then more and more people from the city start coming into the light where they're safe from the monsters. And I mean, the imagery, the, the language, it's impossible to 
not make something of it, right? Of I see the light, I'm coming to the light, the way light destroys darkness. The, I mean, all kinds of, there, there's so much there with religious themes and connotations and illusions that I don't even know how to get into it. So I'm basically not going to, I just, I'm pointing it out for other people who want to explore that further, that there's a lot to be made of that, of what does that do in the series? What's the function of that? Um, what does that do with themes? But there is that weird thing where they're kind of questioning. It's like Bill and Carol, and they're looking down at all these people and they're like, should we stop them from coming into the light? And it's like, no, let them, if that's all they want, if they just want the light. And, and I don't really know what to make of that, but it seems interesting, right? Like we know something that nobody else does. We know what's really happening. And our knowledge of the cosmic shadow war that's been going on gives us the freedom and the ability to try to do something about it. And we're also in the safest place on earth right now. And more people are learning about that and they're coming too. And should we keep this a secret and should we keep this to ourselves or not? And they ultimately decide, no, let them in. So I wonder, I'm not sure, like I say, exactly what to make of it, but there's something going on there. Okay, um, I think I've only got one more note and then I wanted to talk about the um, portrayal of the media. Okay, so this is my, my last note in the actual book. So this is on page 390. Uh, and this is Sylvia, um, who's like, basically there's an earthquake in the building. Everything's um, shaking and creaking and groaning. And then an earthquake, she thought. She remembered the 2011 tremor, but this was much worse. And then down near the edge of the sheep meadow, the earth was cracking open. <sighs> okay, I got a little note there <laughs> that I probably shouldn't read aloud. But my note is, uh, why did we have to get a year? Why was there a specific reference to a year? And if you know, if you've watched my other videos, my recent ones, um, The Last Christmas and Fatal Error, especially, then I talk about this and the timeline of the series. I Wilson just keeps updating the timeline and Night World would function perfectly fine the revised edition would function perfectly fine if there was not a reference to a year where it could just be it could be 2003 it could be 2020 it, there's there's not really specific references to like cultural references or pieces of technology where you would really notice um and then he goes and puts a date in there and i'm like okay but the entire thing is supposed to take place over three years the entire repairman jack series and I've talked about this before, but we have Ground Zero. And Ground Zero is very significant in the timeline in regards to September 11th. So why would Rosalem, using the Septimus Order, orchestrate the September 11th attacks, then going through Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda to then take out the World Trade Center in order to get to the first pillar from Operation Opus Omega because he felt like Operation Opus Omega wasn't going fast enough, so if he could use that, he could turn it into the Finch Manka, which they do with Daryl, who then attacks the lady and it's her second death. Okay. Why would he attack September 11th, get the pillar out, and then wait like 10 years or 20 years before doing anything with it? He His entire purpose in doing that was to be urgent, to be quick about it. And I just don't understand why we can't just have the series just take place from 2000 to 2003. Like 2001 to 2003. Why? Why there was a need to update it. And it's only in a few books. And those references could easily be omitted or changed to references that better reflect the early 2000s. I don't know. I'm really not sure. And in Night World, I think it's just that. I think it's just that one reference to an earthquake from 2011. And aside from that, then we don't really have them. So I don't, if you have thoughts on that, please, because it's driving me crazy. Why is it updated? Do you think that it needs to be updated considering that we have a very significant book in the series and it's significant, not because, not just because of its title, but because of real world events that he's incorporating into the series, which make less and less sense 
the more he updates the series. It makes less and less sense why Rosalind would attack the World Trade Center to get at that pillar if he's then going to then retrieve it and then wait 20 years. He's going to do nothing with it and then wait 20 years. That doesn't make sense to me. So I don't quite get that. All right. Um, I've got one other comment on this and it's it seems like Wilson is critiquing the media and believe me I have no issue with that <laughs> critique away but he's got these moments like where basically to break up the book into different sections then he's got transcripts essentially from what's happening with radio stations and tv stations and things like that and it seems like it's a critique of the media because for most of the book, they just continue right on as usual. It's like, oh yeah, there's a giant hole in Central Park that seems to go to who knows where. We're going to play, you know, dig in a hole. <laughs> and then like, and then as the world gets more and more monstrous and people are dying, it's like the, he's got the, the movie lineup on, um, I forget what TV channel it is, but like how they just keep like showing all these monster movies because that's fun. And and I guess the commentary seems to be even if the world were, were ending, the media would continue to try to capitalize on it to get ratings and to tie in to be trendy and relevant because that'll help their ratings and ad revenue and all of that. And it's so absurd and it makes no sense because it really does seem like it's the end of the world who's advertising on tv anymore who cares if the radio station stays on the air or not like people don't need that necessarily to to just hear like rock and roll and whatever else the radio station ends up becoming more significant as it goes on and the djs you know are doing their very best to report things as accurately as they possibly can but to me it kind of takes away from the book and it takes away because it feels silly. It feels unrealistic. And maybe I'm wrong on that, but I just feel like if we had potentially millions of people dying within a couple days by these creatures from another dimension and more and more holes are opening up, that like the sci-fi network wouldn't just be airing a bunch of monster movies. Like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I hope we never find out <laughs> how these stations would react but at the same time it seems strange i'm like it just it felt silly it didn't feel serious it didn't feel realistic um the other thing too is the pacing of the book we know you know you get i forget the, the person the mathematician who comes up with it but he determines when the last sunrise will be that it ultimately will be on like thursday or friday like friday is going to be the start of night world where we're just not going to have the sun again and you get to, like, it's weird because as much as the world is ending, Jack and Cola Body and even Bill and Glaken, Sylvia, they kind of don't seem in a hurry to do anything. And that just seems weird to me. Of There's no sense of urgency. So as much as the world is ending, it's like, ah, oh, we'll sleep on it. We'll figure it out tomorrow. I won't leave for Hawaii just yet oh, I'm still fine, like Sylvia, I'm still fine in my house. It doesn't matter that my kid's going to die and I know that there's a safe place that I could go. My home is my home. It's like, it it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, it just, again, it kind of pulls away from a sense of verisimilitude in that art should be reflecting life. And what I mean by that is, it's this is a fairly earnest look at humanity and these events like this is not satire it's not a comedic horror novel it's a serious novel it's you know there's supernatural events but all the characters are playing it straight they're all taking this very seriously and then you have those actions that don't really line up with it and i guess i just don't really get some of that i just feel like there should have been a bigger sense of urgency and maybe it would have worked if there were fewer nights until we get to night world or just if jack left earlier for hawaii i don't know something like that so that basically gets me to the end of my thoughts on night world i'm happy that wilson has not he really has stuck to his word 
that he's not going to write anything after night world with that being said i would absolutely read it if he did <laughs> so i'm fine with him stopping there and it does make sense because he's it's a culmination of so many books that he's written and short stories and all of that all of this lore it all comes to night world glaken and Roslam, you know fifteen thousand years of fighting each other and it all comes to a head here and Roslam is ultimately defeated um i like that as far as what i do next in the series boy i am really unsure i don't know what to do um i i plan on sticking to reading the all of the repairman jack books but it's and then the adversary cycle after that but i just don't even know where to go next so i think ultimately what i'm going to do is i'm probably gonna start with the first young adult book so basically let's go back to jack's childhood i'll read those books then i'm gonna read the books in um fear city dark city and cold city i don't know if that's the right order but i'm going to read those ones of jack in new york city i don't know when i'm going to read scarlet redux but that does depend on when it arrives but i think i'm just going to do it in that order and once i get to all of those then i'll read quick fixes which is the short fiction and then from there i'll get into the adversary cycle and i'm going to try to read in the original edition of the tomb because i read the revised edition for the repairman jack project and i also am going to read the original edition of night world at the end of my read of the adversary cycle and i am excited because i have like i say i've not read reborn or reprisal so that'll be good to read those ones and i've only read one of the young adult books so i've got a few books that i get to read for the first time um plus i also have signals and i i've been thinking i'm like oh maybe i should just read signals because if it's a prelude to night world and it sure feels like you could read the last christmas which introduces signals and as i only read the first page but i'm like oh characters from the last christmas because i was sure that that's what he was doing if you if you've read the last christmas you know exactly what i'm talking about that it's all about the signals and you're like oh and then he has a book called signals and the adversary cycle that's coming out so i would say as far as like newer stuff you could read the last christmas signals and then night world and kind of you know read them in that order i don't know but i'll figure it out if you do have thoughts on that though please let me know all right thank you so much for watching i know that that was a, a long one but i feel like it kind of deserved it being the culmination of everything all right i'll see you next time bye